The 2022 NBA trade deadline is over and it's been one of the most exciting in a few years. And just like every deadline, it's brought us some winners and some losers. So here's the best of the best and the worst of the worst. As we saw, the Philadelphia 76ers finally traded Ben Simmons away. In a trade of Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, Andre Drummond, and two first round picks for James Harden and Paul Millsap to the Brooklyn Nets. On paper, it looks like the 76ers may have given up too much, but remembering that Ben Simmons wasn't going to play anyways, so he meant nothing to the team, makes it better. With Philly really only losing out on Seth, Andre, and two firsts. It still does hurt to see Philly lose out on some of their depth, but they had so much of it in the first place, it's okay. Plus, the fact that they were able to get this trade done without giving up Maxi or Thibault is incredible. Now giving them a five of Tyrese Maxi, James Harden, Danny Green, Tobias Harris, and Joel Embiid, with Thibault, Millsap, and a few others still off the bench, making this by far one of the most talented rosters up and down James has ever played on. The combo of himself and Embiid is going to be a sight to see. Harden's game is perfectly complemented through the pick and roll, and the best center he's ever played with was Clint Capella, while Embiid's game is complemented maybe even more by the pick and roll game. But the best backcourt player he's had has been Ben Simmons, which makes that play useless. Now as a team, with three other guys who can really play in a good mix of offense and defense, the expectation for this team is nothing less than a championship. But they've created a problem for themselves in the Brooklyn Nets, who sacrificed Harden, but made up in the areas they lacked, which were depth and defense. Pairing Kevin Durant up with Ben Simmons, it allows Kevin to focus on offense while Ben focuses on defense. If you add in Kyrie Irving to about 10% of their games, he doesn't really make a difference, so let's ignore him. But the depth these two can play with is almost unmatched. Seth Curry, Andre Drummond, LaMarcus Aldridge, Joe Harris, Patty Mills, and Blake Griffin are all who they get to work with, which gives this team a great combination of shooting, defense, and veteran leadership. Starting five for most of their games without Kyrie will probably be Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, Joe Harris, Kevin Durant, and LaMarcus Aldridge, which instantly jumps these two ahead of everyone in the Eastern Conference and convinces most that this will be the Eastern Conference Finals that we're going to see this year. But at the same time, we have to say goodbye to the greatest super team that never was. Possibly the greatest big three in NBA history all on one team, and we never even got to see what they were capable of. That era of the Nets is over, and the new one begins with hopes of an NBA title, but it's not guaranteed with teams like the Bulls and Bucks still in the way because both the 76ers and the Nets have their weaknesses. Because now Philadelphia has two of the more injury-prone players in the entire NBA. Harden's got a bad hamstring, and Embiid seems to get injured every time the playoffs come around. So with Philly, they aren't championship favorites until they actually make it there. And for the Nets, the future's confusing, seeing how they now have two of the most controversial sitting out players in the entire history of the game. They now have two players that have willingly chosen to sit out pretty much this entire season up until now. Going forward, Kyrie will barely play, and who knows if Simmons is going to get his feelings hurt again. While over in Houston, they've definitely fallen on the losing side of things. Bird not making a single trade at the deadline. No Eric Gordon, no Christian Wood, and no John Wall, which means he's going to continue to sit out the entire year for them, and they'll continue to pay him for adding no input to their team. Now, the only way they'll ever going to get out of his bad deal is by flat out just letting it expire. While at the same time, they're also wasting another year of Eric Gordon's prime, who's the guy that could definitely make an impact on any NBA contender, and it's surprising nobody has tried to make a move for him sooner. But nobody has lost out more than the Portland Trailblazers have over this past week. Overall, through a series of trades, they traded CJ McCollum, Robert Covington, Larry Nance Jr., and Norman Powell for Joe Ingles, Eric Bledsoe, Josh Hart, and a few draft picks. So I'm not really seeing where this new Blazers rebuild around Damian Lillard is going to come from, unless they plan on signing some big names in free agency this offseason. But then again, we we know how that usually goes. I just don't see how they've had all this time to make trades for these players and this is the best they came up with. It's not even like they got good young players in return or anything. They got okay role players in the middle of their careers and without a doubt lost all the trades that they made. So these deals instantly made the Blazers losers and the Pelicans and Clippers winners for what they got in return. While on the other hand the Sacramento Kings have finally been making moves after years of doing nothing. But just as you'd expect in casual Kings fashion, they messed it up. Trading their best player in Tyrese Halliburton, their best shooter in Buddy Heald, and Tristan Thompson for DeMontis Sabonis, Justin Holiday, and Jeremy Lamb. From the Kings side of things, you know, I can see why they did it. It was time to switch things up and they wanted to add another young, proven all-star to the team. But they gave up too much, they made a mistake by picking De'Aaron Fox over Tyrese, and now they have no shooters on their team. I mean, they've already committed $170 million to De'Aaron Fox, so they should have known to try and get away from that. In return though, in this deal, the duo of himself and Sabonis, combined with the newly acquired DiVincenzo, could be the start of something new, but I still don't think it's even enough to make the playoffs at this point. While for the Indiana Pacers, they now have a backcourt of Halliburton, Duarte, and Miles Turner down low to build around, while still having Malcolm Brogdon and Buddy Heald as trade assets for next year. Before we get off the Kings completely though, I mentioned they were in another trade, a four-way trade between the Kings, Bucks, Clippers, and Pistons, where the Kings finally traded Marvin Bagley and got Dante DiVincenzo, Trey Lyles, and Josh Jackson. An A-plus move for them. The Bucks gave up Dante, Rodney Hood, and Simi Ojale, and got back Serge Ibaka and two second-round picks. Considering the depth they already had at guard and their lack of depth at center, it's an a 
A-plus move for them too, as he'll be a great fit with Giannis. Clippers gave up two second rounders for Hood and Ojale, and the Pistons gave up two of their young guys for Marvin Bagley. The Dallas Mavericks surprised most by finally seeing clearly and trading Kristaps Porzingis, and they made a move to the Washington Wizards for Davis Bertans and Spencer Dinwiddie, which I think they could have gotten a little more for Kristaps, but I think it's okay that they just got their hands off of him. And it works, Davis Bertans is like a light version of him. He's gotten a lot of disrespect for the deal he has, but that one season a couple years back for Washington was no joke. It was the first time in his career he actually got minutes and he showed up big. But I think in this big role he's gonna have for Dallas, he can do it again. While Dinwiddie is the perfect man to pair up with Luka and be productive as a guard, but also not getting in the way. Well, for the Wizards, it's clear they're trying to reset again. And in a questionable move, they trade their only main point guard for an improvement down low. It'll be fun to see Kristaps with Beal, but honestly, this move doesn't make a ton of difference for where they stand. And it didn't really make sense for them at all. From Dallas's point of view, I get it, but from Washington's, it doesn't add up. Of course, it's good to change up the roster, but that's only a good idea if the team can actually be made better. If I'm the Washington Wizards, I'm just trading Bradley Beal at the end of the season. And then trading Montrezl Harrell for Vernon Carey and Ish Smith didn't make any sense either, which I think shows that we're not just missing out on some genius plan that they have that we're not going to see coming. It pretty much shows that they just really don't know what they're doing because they got nothing back in return. Charlotte's third string point guard and a guy that averages two points per game for Montrez, who's a former six man of the year. But for Charlotte, it's great. I wish they would have gotten someone a little more dominant down low that could control the paint, but it's better than nothing. As for the Celtics, I think they're winners too. They traded Josh Jackson, Romeo Langford, and a pick for Derek White to run point guard, hoping they move on from the mistake that was Dennis Schroeder. And to further make up for their mistakes, they traded Schroeder in a deal to get back Daniel Tice. It's a little weird now for them because that makes two players that they've traded away, then later traded to get back. But at least they're still winners for this deadline. The Spurs won too thanks to that Derek White trade, as well as getting Goran Dragic, who will be bought out, and a first round pick in exchange for Thaddeus Young, Drew Eubanks, and a second round pick. Getting some good young assets in return for pieces that they really didn't need on their team. But also consider the Orlando Magic winners getting Bull Bull in return for a second round pick. They now have a ton of players on their roster that are young, full of potential, but haven't showed it all just yet. If at least one of these guys breaks out one day, then they'll be in good hands. And finally, the Phoenix Suns didn't do much, but they had a solid move in adding Tory Craig, who's an excellent defender on their team and is going to come in handy in a lot of different late playoff situations for them. Losers I didn't mention who made no moves are without a doubt the Lakers and the Knicks, because now they're going to continue to be terrible. The Rockets offered John Wall for Russ in a first, and I'm really surprised LA didn't take that deal. Clearly, they're not winning with Russ, and it seems like Wall's a much better fit for the team anyways. He's more passive, a better shooter, and more consistent if he can stay healthy. And as for the Knicks, well, Julius Randle reportedly requested a trade and didn't get one, so now things might just get pretty weird. The trade deadline never goes as predicted, and we clearly saw a lot of wildcard moves being made. So comment down below which was your favorite deal that went down, and one that you wish would have happened that didn't. Like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed. I'm out.